So now it's time to find out what's going on with the through hull and seacock. But first we have to put a plug in on the outside. So I got a wooden plug, and I got a hammer, and I got a string tied on the hammer. The water's only about 10 feet, but it's kind of murky, so if I drop that hammer, chances are I'm never going to find it again. So I'll tie a string onto it, put the string around my wrist. Perhaps it would be useful to review what a traditional seacock is. There's a piece of pipe that goes through the hull. That is the through hull, and there's a mushroom fitting that threads in from the outside that clamps it and holds it to the hull. Then there's a tapered piece of pipe which is perpendicular to the through hull. And inside that tapered piece of pipe goes a tapered plug. And it's held in by a nut at one end and there's a handle at the other. And inside that tapered plug there's a hole bored through it. When you move the handle such that the hole is parallel to the through hull, then water can pass through. When it's perpendicular it shuts the water off. So it's a valve. Okay, so the plug is in on the outside, but there's still water trickling in. Um, so this is, uh, it's got me a little nervous, but we can see here's the hole in the, in, the, uh, in the pipe. So now that I've got that, now that I've got that dry, I should be able to put an epoxy, just epoxy that in, and uh, hopefully that'll seal it. So the hope is we can just, we can limp along, get something that won't leak, and so we can limp along to our next haul out. Uh, we'll see how this goes. So we can see what's happened here. This is the, the tapered plug to the seacock, and you can see the edges here uh, have either corroded or electrolysis. They've worn away, and that, that's where the water's getting in. What I'm going to try to do is put some epoxy here and just ferret smooth and then put the plug back in and maybe that'll fix it. I'm kind of jumping the gun here. This epoxy is not completely cured, but I'm starting to sand, sand some of it back and get it smooth. continuing to launch and adjust here. The hole is too big for straight epoxy. Uh, so I put a little fiberglass roving there. So kind of a wad of fiberglass roving. And uh, I'll slather some more epoxy on that. And uh, hopefully that'll, uh, that, that'll, uh, that'll seal it. Uh, this, is definitely, uh, this is definitely a Gilligan's Island fix here. So we're doing the best we can. So we'll try putting a nice healthy dose of grease on here and see what happens. So, so far with the seacock closed, it appears to be watertight. We have fingers and toes crossed here. Well, unfortunately our repair to the elbow did not hold. Um, and the seacock does not completely shut off. Uh, after a while, it began to, the water began to work its way up to the hull and coming through. Um, so I'm going to try another repair of this. Another possibility is just to saw off right below the elbow there and just attach another hose to it. Um, so if this doesn't work, we can try that. So this one looks pretty easy. Just took the electrical tape off and uh, as you can see the, the negative wire just broke. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's a pretty obvious problem and uh, luckily pretty easily fixed. Well it turns out this is not so simple. Tested this out last night and uh, the light only, when I had it all uh, connected there, I only got a very dim light. And it uh, turns out there's hardly any current coming from the battery. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this wire is bad. So I'm going to have to pull the wire out and replace it. Uh, first I have to get more wire. 
So that's on uh, next day delivery from Amazon. So we keep going at it here. So by the miracle that is Amazon.com, the new duplex wire has arrived. So I'm running it, uh, running the new wire through here. And the day I chose to do this just happened to be a day a front was going through. And so shortly after I finished running the wire, the wind abruptly shifted to the north and picked up well into the 20 knot range. And we're still getting just a little bit of protection from Boob Key, but it's kind of kind of rough. So I ended up going back to the old repair of uh, putting some epoxy on the inside of duct tape and wrapping it around. And that has a little bit of moisture right there, but that's pretty much stopped the leak. As you can see down here, this is all dry. And I put a cloth diaper around it, but um, even, even the cloth here is just... Uh, it's a little damp, and uh, that's all I can detect. And this has been here for several days now. So for all intents and purposes, the leak has stopped. And hopefully this will be sufficient to get us to our next haul out. So today's fun project, we got to replace the propane supply line. Uh, we got a leak somewhere. Um, and in here is this old is old copper piping. And what generally happens over time, and that's been in there since I've had the boat, so it's uh, uh, 17, 18 years, going on 18 years now, is that it, uh, it corrodes and you get little pinhole leaks. Uh, so we're going to replace it here with this flexible hose. And uh, hopefully that will solve our problems. So first step is I have to pick the stove up off its gimbals and move it forward a bit away from the bulkhead so that I can unscrew uh, the supply hose at the, at the stove end. So that's what I'm doing right now. Then I'm going to have to remove some furniture so that I can get at the old copper hose. What I'm going to do is just take a hacksaw to the old hose and, and uh, saw it up into segments. So that'll make it much, much more easy to extract. I purchased 20 feet of flexible supply hose and the terminals are pre-made with the 3 8 inch flanges on them uh, which makes it easy, real easy, it's just plug and play but of course that means I'm going to have to drill some bigger holes in the furniture to get the new hose through so that's what I'm doing right now so now it's time to attach the supply hose to the stove end and then gradually we're going to work it through the furniture back through the cockpit and back to the sealed locker in the lazarette where the propane tank is. So I just added a few little cable cable leads, fair leads there. Uh, this was back when it was the copper pipe, it was just bent into shape, but uh, since we have flexible hose, it's going to need a little more support there. Okay, so now we run it through the cockpit, underneath the cockpit here. And the last thing we got to do get down underneath there and uh, just connect the end uh, where it goes in. Okay, so here we are back in the propane locker. We've got everything connected at both ends. So let's turn the tank on and see if it comes up to pressure here. Slowly coming up to pressure. And of course the big test is when we turn the tank valve off if it holds pressure to be at pressure. Let's try turning the valve off here. And so far we're holding. We want that to hold for a couple of minutes. So after about five minutes it has dropped. Um, so there's still a slow leak somewhere. But uh, at least I can be pretty confident it's not in the supply line. So it's either the stove at the stove end or somewhere right in here. 
Well, I've now replaced the entire propane line. As you can see, there used to be a juncture point right here with a connector. And uh, I just drilled a hole right through there. So now this is one continuous line going from the regulator straight to the stove. And we still have a leak. So it can only be one of two things. One, it's the shutoff valve on the stove. It's not shutting off all the way. Or uh, it's this regulator, possibly the vent there. Uh, it's not working properly and it's leaking. And uh, well, a new stove costs about $1,300 and a new regulator costs about $80. So let's try replacing the regulator first. Everything hooked up here. Drum roll, please. All right, came right up to pressure. That's good. Let's turn the valve off and see what happens. All right, so so far we're holding, and we're supposed to hold for three minutes. been about three minutes. So let's take a look here. And it is pretty much held pressure. Maybe dropped just a little, just slightly. Uh, but before it was, um, it had dropped noticeably after three minutes. Uh, so it looks like we're going to be good. Let's just turn the gas on here and see what happens. Very little change. So it's basically, it's pretty much holding pressure. So I think that, that's going to do. Well, it's Sunday morning, a little after 5 in the morning, and uh, I'm up earlier than I planned to be, even though I did want to get an early start. Um, so we're on our way to Key West. We're right here in Marathon. We're anchored uh, just about where the little wind, uh, uh, little wind flag is here. Um, and uh, we're just anchored outside behind Marathon Key. And uh, the reason the reason we're up early this morning is uh, these uh, these winds are really south southeast, and we're losing the protection of uh, of Marathon Key. And uh, there is a fringing reef here that knocks down the ocean swell, but we're getting a wind chop. So uh, I was woken up about half an hour ago by the by the boat uh, starting to pitch, and the winds were light most of the night. Um, so uh, uh, so I figured might as well just uh, get our Get get the day started here. Uh, so we're 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 gonna go to Key West, and uh, let's just check our weather forecast. This is a run of about 40 miles, and it's actually gonna get a little lighter. Southeast 10 knots. That's just after the beam, so that looks pretty nice. As we get around two in the afternoon, still saying the same thing. How about four in the afternoon? Yeah. Now uh, this is not updating. Okay, so we still got southeast at about 11 knots or so. 
So uh, that's a beam. Rates a little after the beam, so that's pretty nice sailing. And as we get toward Key West, uh, southeast at eight, so we'll be on a broad rate. So it looks like pretty good sailing here. And then it's going to pick up later tonight, uh, but uh, we should be into. The plan is to go into Garrison Bight, uh, which is right around on the west side of Fleming Key. And uh, I've never been to Key West, so th this is all this is all new and exciting. Um, but anyway, as soon as we get some light here, I'll, I'm going to get up on deck and start getting ready to get underway. So the folks at City Marina Garrison Bight tell me that there is one mooring available. They do not assign moorings here uh, by number. Uh, if there is one mooring available, you may see several balls without boats on them, but only one of them is actually available for a new boat. The other ones are currently being paid for by other customers. So I spot an open ball and I'm going to try to pick that one up, but first I'm going to do a sail by. Before I actually attempt sailing up to the mooring, I'm going to sail past it and take a look at what the pickup looks like, uh, how long the hawser is, is there a pickup buoy, etc. I'm also going to just get a gauge from being right at the mooring, how much room I have on either side of me, which would be the best tack to approach the mooring on. Uh, will I have room if I miss it to fall off and, and gather speed and so forth? So I'm just going to get a feel for the situation in the current wind and weather conditions right around that mooring before I attempt to actually sail up to it. So I've done the recon. 
I'm going to put her through a jibe here. And jibo. Now we're on starboard tack. I'm going to come up on the wind, and I've decided that it's best to approach the mooring on port tack. So I'm going to come up on starboard and choose where I'm going to tack over so that hopefully that will put me on a close reach to the mooring ball. So I'm judging that right now, looking around. And it looks like I'm going to tack here. And here we go. So here we are coming on to port tack. The mooring ball is just, just about dead ahead. Now it's off our port bow. And we are indeed on a close reach. I'm going to ease the main sheet a bit so I can luff her up slightly uh, if I need to cut, cut down on my speed. And uh, then, of course, the trickiest part is to pick when to shoot up into the wind toward the mooring so that you'll have just enough way on her to get up to the mooring, but not so much that you sail right over it. So helm -lee right now, so I'm coming up, I'm making my final approach. I'll scurry forward with the boat hook and a piece of line to tie on to the mooring. Right there, I've I've got the uh, I've got the mooring ball, the loop and the hawser on the mooring ball. And now I'm passing the line through it, and I'll just quickly tie that down to a cleat forward, just so just so that we're tied on. And there we go. You can see we're we're tied on now. She's coming up back up head to wind. Now I'll scandalize the mainsail first, just to take the power out of it so she doesn't sail around so much. But I forgot to take up on the lift, so I'll do that right now. Now that she's up head to wind, I can go ahead and drop the mainsail. So the boat is safely tied on to the mooring. And now it's time to furl up, coil down, straighten up, and call it a day.